Let's kill the lights a little bit first. Yes. Yes. I saw you. Some some faces I'm I'm starting to uh, put to names or the other way around. Um, we're way ahead in the in the. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Went down the wrong way. <coughs> Uh, in the syllabus, so we're going to keep doing this, but I'm also going to um, maybe have a little fun today with, with something else. A couple of things um, back with the Indo-European. Uh, I, I brought in that uh, a Xerox of that, I think, index card I mentioned before that I had a student 25 years ago uh, who wrote a big, long word in Turkish. So I brought in that. I brought in a book. Um, called The Mummies of Urumqi. Really fascinating topic. If you're at all interested in Indo-European, this is about Tukarians. Um, and so I'm going to show you a bunch of these images, a bunch of the pictures that they include in this book. But let's go back to where we left off the other day. And these are the correct notes. Okay, I printed them out this morning because I'm going to put the Germanic um, tree back up. So we left off with talking about the part up here. I've got to remember to bring my laser pointer. Um, the part up here about weak and strong adjectives and such. We discussed that uh, just about the last thing the other day. So move on to 6.3.5. Germanic languages have first syllable stress. Um, most of the other Indo-European languages, stress can be varied. It can be first, second syllable. It's often the second syllable. But in Germanic languages, it's primarily first uh, syllable with a few exceptions. For example, when there are prefixes. Modern German. That's a G. Uh, spelling, not positive about it. Geschichte. Okay? It's history. This is the first syllable in terms of stress. Why? It's just a prefix. Modern English, believe. We don't stress this, we stress this. Why? This is a prefix. Okay, It's something that gets um, added at the beginning. So all words have this first syllable stress, except as noted, you know, um, when there's a prefix. Modern German, tragen. Okay. Listen, this in, schmecken, beginnen, okay, um, geschichte, right? And notice what happens when you have a third syllable, like with geschichte. That third syllable often is unstressed completely, okay? We'll talk about this when we get to um, Old English and its development into. Middle English, because in Anglo-Saxon, that final syllable was still pronounced. Right, um, whatever the syllable was, even if it was a final e, it was pronounced uh. Right, but you move from there to Middle English, and that final e syllable stops being dropped, starts being dropped off. Similarly, in words like this, in British English. Okay. Internal syllables that are not stressed tend to be elided. That is, American English, Canterbury, one, two, three, four syllables. British English, Canterbury, three syllables. Laboratory, laboratory, or laboratory in British English. Lavatory, lavatory. Secretary, secretary. Okay. In those final syllables here, okay, that vowel usually gets completely elided in British English. We'll talk about that later. Um, 6.36, vowel shift. This occurs across the Germanic languages. Okay, Or from Indo-European to Proto-Germanic. 
This and this will be the hardest things to remember, okay, in terms of these seven characteristics. But you got to remember these because these are what enable you to look at, for example, Latin. And even if you don't know Latin, to kind of go, hmm, I wonder if applying these principles, that is, applying this knowledge, if I can piece out what that word would be in German or English. So, Indo-European short O becomes Proto-Germanic short A. Gosti, guest, that's the word it is, becomes modern German Gast. Go, ga. Octo, act. Okay. Um, nox, N O X, night. Nacht, night in German. Okay. So short O becomes short A if you want. All right. Long A, what we call long A, it's long A becomes Proto-Germanic long O. Brachter, Broder. Mater, Moder. Octo, O-C-T-O, becomes Ach, eight. Okay? Um, sorry, that was uh, the short one. So, and I think I've got more examples of this... Um, of this. So, the hardest part of all this Germanic stuff. First sound shift, also called Grimm's Law. Okay? Why? Because Jacob Grimm is the one who kind of formulated this. He, he, it's not that he was sitting in his study one night and said, hmm, I think I want to come up with this law. What did he do? He looked at Germanic and the Indo-European languages and said, this is happening. And he formulated it kind of as a law. This always happens. That is, it seems to be a rule of sorts. Not that, you know, people are thinking about it. It's just it always applies. With some exceptions. Okay? The, the biggest exception is called Werner's Law, which I don't go into in the notes. It's in your textbook. Okay? It explains some of the exceptions. So, the first step. In the what's called first sound shift. <clears throat> now, I show this as three steps. Okay? Note, this representation does not show the intermediate voice fricative change. That is, there are some textbooks, History of the English Language, that will actually show this as four or sometimes even five steps. That is, they're showing intermediate changes from one sound to a final sound. They show it goes from here to here, then to here. Okay. What your textbook emphasizes and what these notes emphasize is from here to what it finally becomes. Okay. Because what it becomes in here really isn't all that important to us because we don't see that. All right? So... The first one, Indo-European aspirated voice stops become Proto-Germanic, notice this is the intermediate part, become Proto-Germanic unaspirated voice stops. Notice the change. In this sentence that's describing these, only one thing changes. What is it? Aspiration. Aspiration. That's the sound. So, Indo-European aspirated voice stops. Ba, da, ga. Become Proto-Germanic unaspirated voice stops. Ba, da, da. There's no, no, you know, stalker heavy breathing coming after those stop sounds. So, in each example, you have a sentence that describes it, okay, and then you have a formula.
formula that shows the sound change. Be able to do both on an exam. Because an exam, the exam, might say, show me Grimm's Law. Write the sentence, give me the formula, and give me an example for each change. You might ask that. It might give you this and say, write a sentence that describes that. Well, that's what that is up above. Or write a sentence that describes this. That's what this is. So, here are the examples. Indo European, ba, Germanic, ba, ga, da, ga, ga. So, you have Indo European words with an asterisk, sometimes because it appears not many Indo European words began with initial sound like this. We use Latin as, as an example. So, Indo European, brother, brother, de, do, gosti, guest. Bread, break, dwyer, door, head, get, bago, beach, duchater, daughter, gaido, goat. Notice, by the way, this and this are kind of similar. We think the word for daughter is related to the word for doe. And it's probably, the ideology behind it, is probably one who needs. That is, needs dough. Okay? Not needs, it's like a needy child. Okay? So those are all the voiced, aspirated um, stops to the unvoiced, aspirated stop. Okay? Step two. <clears throat> this is a revision in the latest version of the textbook. Okay? So I included it in the notes. Ex except when preceded by a s sound, Indo-European voiceless stops become Germanic voiceless fricatives. Huh becomes t becomes k becomes cap becomes. Or kaput becomes head, okay? Ped becomes foot, k becomes th, trace becomes three, okay? So, ped, foot, trace, three, cared, heart. Where do we still see this? You don't, you don't see a heart doctor today. What do you see? You see a cardiologist, okay? Pissed fish. Notice, Latin, turba, thorpe, okay, can, hall, hell, we're going to look at this word, because it gives us a, it gives us a whole bunch of words in modern English. Pur, fire, what do you burn a body on? A pyre, okay, so you burn a body on a fire, kind of is a little bit redundant and tautological. Ten. Not the number becomes thin, cop becomes heave and have. Okay? Third step. Um, sorry, knock me off filter a little bit. Indo European voice stops, but the ga, which remember. First stop, voice aspirated stops, <laughs> become Germanic, Indo European voice stops, become Germanic voiceless stops. Okay? So, apple, apple, duo, two, gno, no, well, where do we still see this? In modern English, derivative of Latin. Gnostic, ignorant, G-N-O. The root there is knowing. The, in, the I before just means what? I don't know. I am totally ignorant when it comes to particle physics. It doesn't mean I'm stupid. 
It just means I've never learned. I've never been aware, so to speak. Okay? Yeah, yeah, that's right, sir. Turba, Thorpe. Okay? Dent, Tooth, Glen, Queen, Dub, Deep, Drew, Tree, and then Gno, No, and Ken. So, this is kind of important. For some reason, there were very few Indo-European words that began with a B sound. Okay? And then I say, see Watkins for examples. Watkins is this. American Heritage Dictionary of Indo-European Roots, which is available on the web. I don't even know that you can actually still buy this. You could probably get used copies, but I don't think it's available. I don't think it's in print. Yes? Did you ever have something that was really something that was really used to do with that? Or something? Uh, I'm sure that's where Druid comes from, because the Druids worship trees. Um... Well, that's strange. And it's not showing up in Watkins. I'll have to look at another um, book I have on Indo European roots. Okay, so let's go from there to. So that's, that's Germanic, and we're going to go back in a moment. So you have here, one, two, three, four examples of, let's say, Old Germanic. Okay? Pater Noster, it's the Our Father, it's the Lord's Prayer. So you have Gothic. Gothic is the early, earliest attested form of Germanic languages. Okay? We know about Gothic because of a bishop named, you could go with either of these, Wolfilas or Wolfilas, okay, who was a, a Gothic bishop in the fourth century, okay. Um, Gothic, not like we think, you know, Scandinavia, Balkans. Southern Bulgaria, Macedonia, um, Serbia, that, that area. And Ufalus was a Arian bishop. Okay? He subscribed to what's called the Arian heresy. And um, okay, how am I going to see here? Um, he translated portions of the Bible into Gothic. And we have these portions in a couple of pretty famous manuscripts because of what they're written in, the color of the ink. I mean, uh, gold and purple, if I remember right. But it's not just gold colored, it's gold. It's like gold dust ink, okay? Um, so he translated passages of the Bible, but the passages he translated are all non-martial, non-warfare. Take a stab at why he would translate those passages. Well, what are the Goths known for? Like Visigoths, Ostrogoths? Yeah. They attacked and sacked and destroyed Rome. They were the, you know, the barbarian hordes, so to speak. Okay? They were a very martial people. I mean, killing, slaughtering, raping, pillaging, that kind of thing. He, he was trying to tone that down a little bit. All right, and again, he's a bishop, right? So he's he's trying to spread, you know, this peaceful new religion among the gods. So we have his version, or we have 
you know, an early version of the Lord's Prayer in Gothic. Okay, that's 4th century. That's Southern Europe, Germanic. Old Saxon, Northern European Germanic. Okay, just look at, you know, um, almost all of them. The Old Saxon, the Old English, and the St. Paul Alamanish, 1000 A.D., how do they all begin? Fatter, fatter, fatter. Gothic doesn't begin with father. Octa, yes it does. Octa is father. Octa unser, thu in himenam. That's our father, who in heaven. Fatter is usa, firaho barno, fatter ure. Let's just look at the old English. Fair ure, through the art on heaven. Father, our, who is in the heavens. The U-M ending, it's data plural. Okay? That's that, that ending that I said all the Germanic languages share with the Baltic, Baltic Slavic languages. Data plurals end in U-M for some reason. Okay? See thing nama yahedagod. Be your name hallowed. And what happens in the development of the language is this, which at this time is god, becomes and then just drops. Hallowed. Yahal take that off. Or yahalod. Yahalod. Okay? To become a thing reach, let it come to thin thine riche, like the third Reich kingdom. Ye were the thin willa, may it happen, thin willa, your will, on Erathon, on earth, swa swa, just as, or literally modern English, so so, because that's the word from which we get so. Back here, as it is in the heavens. Erna to us, big long word that we no longer have at all. We have individual elements of it. Erna yadai, die, day, huam, kind of like to whom, leech john, leech of the body, loaf, loaf. So, give us all of this kind of means today. <laughs> <laughs> Our loaf, sila, this word has changed almost 100%. We still use the derivative of it, but we use it in a different way. Sila, sell. Sell us today. But for us today, selling means what? I get money. It doesn't mean, you know, this is give. So give us today our each day body. All of this, daily. All of that is just daily. So for us, daily bread sell us today. <laughs> On for on for either, because you'll hear different professors of Anglo-Saxon pronounce this and this two different ways. It's either for you us ur giltas or on for you us ur giltas. Okay, we'll talk about the palatal and the hard j g or y g. Um, when we get to Anglo-Saxon, and forgive us our guilt, modern English debts or trespasses, swa swa, so so, just as we forgive our to us, if you want, guilt and doom, guilt doers, almost like he's talked about George Bush, those. Evil guilt doers, you know. 
and then your lad picked this up, because we don't use it anymore. Read. And not lead you, us, on totally gone. Just It's completely out of English vocabulary. Lead us not into evil. Uh, excuse me, into temptation. Ock, but lose. Close. Or lose. Pronounce that with a smooth s. A loose. A loose us. Of evil. How do you loose someone of evil? But release us of evil. It's almost what he said. So, let me do it all in old English. Tadda ure. Tuthi eric on heavenu. Sifti nama yahalbo. Tobi komat in riche. The word that in real on Erlan, swa swa on Yelvan. When a Yadai Juan Richard Loft, Sil us to die. But for you was Ur Yeltas, swa swa way for Yelat, Urum Yeltendum. And a Yelat us on Costana, Ach Lusa us of evil. So when you have the Y, E, like Pepe Le Pew, E, so evil, lose us, Sil us. For you, us, yilt us, or yilt us, for you, us, okay? So that's, that's Anglo-Saxon. That's how Anglo-Saxon sounded. But notice just in that, I mean, you can look at that modern English speaker, and if you've never read or heard any Anglo-Saxon, could you pick out any words that be that still survive in the modern English? Yes. Which ones? Like forgive. Forgive? What else? Father, Frank. heaven, name. name, where's earth, earth, heaven again, it's not rice, become your rice today, come Uncle Ben, right? so there's not many, maybe, Right? So, I mean, it's less than 50%. Unless you start looking at things like we. Okay, that's pretty clear. And. On, on, and. Okay. Okay. Um, now, let me go back for a moment. Because I have some other examples. Back up here, because I, I went from this to the seven characteristics. I think that's the one I went from. Yeah, from there to the seven characteristics. And notice I've got. Some of the examples, I think, are the same, but others are um, obviously different. Bleh. Notice up here, under the b to b, bleh, it has a dash. Why? Because this is just the root. We're not concerned about how the noun gets inflected at its ending. Become, or excuse me, how the verb gets conjugated. The verb is bleh, blauen. Bleh, blauen. Um, break, old English break, modern English break, bear, barren, okay, berg, old English berg, or fortress if you want, town, bend, bindan, del, del, barda, beard, okay, what this tells us is that we can we can reconstruct, and it's not just from Old English, it's from all the Indo-European languages, that we can reconstruct the word for beard indicates something about the Proto-Indo-Europeans. They had beards. Hopefully just the men. Okay? But beards were, were common by the very fact that they're common among all um, their descendants. Dwer becomes Old English Duru, which is door. Drag, Old English dragon which is modern English drag, okay? 
which is related, ultimately, that word to tractor and other things like that. Reed, Old English reed, dare, Old English derk or dark. Okay. Gusty, Old Norse gester, Old English guest, Latin. Not only the um, one that shows up later, but also host. Okay. So that that leads to things like modern English, ghost, guest, and host. Like a host of enemies, an army host, but also like the host in the Catholic Eucharist. Right? Del, Delda, Dahab, Yevon, which is to give, Grind, Grindon, probably the etymology or the source behind the name of Grendel right? in the Old English Beowulf. Gahaf, Old English Ghost, Modern English Goose. Right? Voiceless stops become voiceless fricatives. Pad foot, click, flax, Modern English flax, F L A X. Fast, fast, uh, which doesn't mean fast, it means firm, steady. Okay? Flat, Old Norse flatter. Okay? It's from. Um, <coughs> Flatter, uh, flatter, pure, fire, paired, Old English, fair tongue. Right? The fact that we can reconstruct, which is fart, by the way, the fact that we construct that word tells us what? Okay, first of all, they're human. <laughs> but all the Indo Europeans, linguistic groups, have essentially that word. We don't know whether it's humorous or merely physiological slash biological, okay? Trey, Thria, Tong, Funkian, thanks. Terse, Thirst, Ken, Thin, Old English spelling. Treb, Old English Thorpe. I used the Latin turba in the other example. Cared, Hair, which is the one that also gives us card, part. Kaito, Old English um, hat. I've completely gone a blank on that one. Right? Not you. Ken, Hel, Kylo, Hal. This actually is related to this. Right? Quo, Hua, Kad, Heta. Okay? Hua, by the way, Old English Hua. Modern English. Who? The HW gets reversed. So almost everywhere in Old English where you see an HW, immediately turn the WH around and see if it makes any more sense in modern English. Okay? And if you know that Old English long A becomes modern English long O, hua, actually, um, not long O, but the U sound, right? then Old English, for example, Leaving the vowel, leaving the um, Grimm's Law aside, Old English twa, T W A. Modern English, two. The A ah becomes U sound, okay? Um, which we'll talk about when we get there. So we're, we're here. The book, pa. Abel, apple, bach, pega, bend, pin, okay? Uh, versa, Purse, be, pock, like pox, swelling, pustule, you know, kind of thing. Um, Duo, two, drew, maybe that's where I had it. It spelled wrong. Uh, old English, trial, tree, dent, old English, tot, dial, dalin, to deal. The deal doesn't mean like this. I mean, that's the modern English word. What's it mean? To separate. When you're dealing cards, you're separating. You're separating what to do and what to do to you. So, right? Ed Etan and Del Kellon. Okay, is there anything else in there of those? 
Now, let's, um, let me go back a second. So, look at this one real briefly. This is the Game Corleza even off um, chart. Takarian's way over here at the southern end of the Gobi Desert. Okay? So, who are Takarians? Takarians, if you remember the linguistic division in Indo-European, two main divisions, right? What are they? Kintum and Satum. Kintum, for the most part, western side of a line from about Lithuania to Greece. Okay? Satum, for the most part, on the eastern side of that, with the exception of Takarian. Why? Because Takarian is the easternmost spoken Indo-European language, but it is a Kintum part. That is, it's in the other, it's not in the Satam branch, it's in the, the um, Kintum branch. How? How did it get way over there? We don't know, first of all. I mean, there's, there's, not any real good, hard theory as to how the Takarians ended up there. What we know about Takarian is the, the, there are two written forms of Takarian, Takarian A and B. Right? They both survive in texts written in about the 8th century. And the texts are all Buddhist texts. 8th century A.D. Okay? Texts are all Buddhist scriptures, essentially. But they're related to what are called the mummies of Urumqi. Urumqi is essentially a place that these mummies were found. This burial site was found in the 20th century. And this book is written by Elizabeth Whalen Barber. She is a historian of textiles. Sound pretty dull and boring to me, but... She got to work with the textiles with the mummies of Urumqi, okay? And I'm going to just show you um, some of the images, you know, that show up. For example, I'm trying, I'll try to keep this flat, and I've got to zoom way back out. This guy. who was one of those found, and I don't know if you can read the inscription, mummy of a 55-year-old male known as Churchin Man from tomb to at Churchin, circa 1000 B.C., okay? In the southern Terran Basin, he was six feet, six inches tall, right? Light brown hair, white deerskin boots, brightly colored Woolen pants, shirt, and felt leggings. Let's go down and look. Focus on the leggings. Okay? You can see, you know, like stripes. These are woven. They're not, um, I mean, the, the, what do I, what's the word I want? The fibers are dyed, but then woven in, into this pattern. Again, 1000 BC. So, go from there to <clears throat> this one. Let me scroll out a little bit. I don't know how well you're going to be able to see these. The image at the bottom. Mummy of church and woman. My hands are bloody with it. 
Um, she stood over six foot tall, wore a red dress, white deerskin boots. Now let me zoom in on her face. Can you, do you notice anything? Left side of her nose, just beneath the eye socket. Right there. She's got tattoos. Okay. What kind of tattoo is that? What's it look like? It's a swirl. Okay. She has other tattoos on her face that don't show up really well. There's another one here. Triangle here. Okay. Again, she's about six foot tall, or a little bit over, six foot one. Okay. Look at this image. Blue shawl. Okay, from one of the tombs, with other colors in it. I don't know if that shows up very well. That's a baby. Infant, felt bonnet, blue wool, red edging. Again, about a thousand BC. Stones over the child's eyes. Tiny wisps of red wool in the nostrils. Here's a better picture of. Right? <laughs> Looks like a doll almost. Cloth made of all kinds of. Bands and colors and such. And this one. This is called the Beauty of Lulan or the Lulan Woman. About 2000 BC. She's dressed in clothes of wool, fur, fur moccasin. She's got a comb, wheat basket, large winnowing tray, leather shoes, if I remember correctly. This is another piece of fabric. Notice that's all woven. And this stuff dates from this one, about 450 BC. So looms were already in production for a long time. You have another child here, eight years old. What I'm getting to is... What does that look like? I wore this shirt intentionally. It's plaid. Now, who's famous for wearing plaid? The Scots. I haven't talked about it, but several of these mummies, red hair, red eyebrows, red eyelashes, blue eyes, wearing plaid. This is in China, folks, or Mongolia, if you want, southern Mongolia. Why? Why are they wearing, you know, these colors? So here is, for example, um, plaids from Hallstatt, Austria. Here's a better image of one. Compare that with that. And that, that's a modern, okay? This one up here, excuse me, this, this is a reproduction of a fragment that dates from about 1200 to 700 BC. That is, this is what it would have looked like new, the bottom one. Pardon? Um, here's another. This is a diagram of a red, white, blue plaid cloth. Again, 1200 to 700 BC. Plaid is not native to, uh, we don't need that, to China, Mongolia, etc., etc. So it's thought. This one up. It's thought that the mummies okay, were the descendants of the Tokarians. 
They were found in the same area as the Tokarian documents, okay? Um, but they weren't found with any kind of textual material with them. Yeah, for the most part. Um, with themselves. So, let's move on to... Uh, the very last. Stay open, are you? So, use this one, I think. Notice you have this is from the Indo European um, American Heritage Dictionary of Indo European Roots. You've got Cal 1 and a bunch of meanings for it. And then Cal 2, this is another root. In Indo European. Right? Basic meaning to cover, conceal, save. Right? So when you have this O grade, that means this is where you get a change in the vowel and it leads to these kind of derivations from that one root. And we're going to see that with a whole bunch of entries. Next couple minutes is just all the kinds of words that descend from this, this one root. So, its basic meaning, meaning, as I said, is to cover, conceal, save. So you have Germanic, Hollyo, underworld, a concealed place. Right? And, for example, Old English hell. Old English hell does not mean the place of fire and brimstone and suffering. It's just uh, the Germanic kind of, the cold place you go to when you die and you just kind of sit there for nearly all eternity and go, it's really cold. Be like today for eternity outside. So, the other kind hell, Old Norse hell, the underworld, goddess of death. Hell, uh, that is the goddess of death, hell, not Kate Bridget. Germanic hollow, covered place, hall, like Old English hell or hall, modern. When it gives it in all caps like this, that's the modern English derivation, okay? Old Norse Hol, Hal, Valhalla, that's where it derives from the Old Norse. A suffix form, that is, take this form with this vowel change, K O L, and add this suffix on, and you get Greek, Koleon, Koleos, sheath, from which we get these Latin words, Coleus, Coleoptera, etc., etc. Second, Here's the first O grade form. Here's another, a zero grade form. That is K. And no specified vowel. K. Okay. What comes from that? Germanic Hul, as in Old English Hulu, or husk or pod. Okay. Pod, that which covers, because usually most people don't eat the pod that contains the peas. They take the peas out. Unless it's, you know, sugar peas and that kind of thing. Hull, okay? Old English, hull, hollow, hull, H-O-L-E. You could probably add in there, you know, Middle Tennessean, holler. Just, what is it? It's a hole kind of in the earth. Old English, hull, hull, hollow, hollow. Old English, how? Secret place. Here, small hollow. I've never seen the word ha or ha. Dutch holster, that which covers modern holster. Suffix Germanic form, hufti, medieval Latin hufton, protective covering. From that we get housing. Another form of that, Latin occultus. Okay. See. This point five below for occultus. Go back to the other one. Here's another form, Latin clam in secret, right? Because the clam clams up, holds what it contains in secret. 
From that we get, from this form, we get clandestine. Suffix variant form calopio in Greek, kind, covet, calypso, calyptra, apocalypse, eucalyptus. What is an apocalypse? That's the kind of the common understanding of it. It's a revealing. The a uh part means because the calypse part is what's hidden. So the a uh means not. Not what's hidden. It's the unhiddenness. It's the revealing of something. Right? What else? Full grain form that is kind of like back to the original root, Germanic. Helmet or helm, protective covering, as in Old English helm. See, it's in modern English we add the et for some reason. We think helm means like the part of the boat that steers the rudder and everything. But a helm is merely a protective covering. So your helm can be over your chest, something that protects your chest. Your helm can be on your head, something that protects your head. Right? Protection covering helm, Frankish helm, helmet, that came from the source of Middle English helmet, Latin oculera, gives us a bunch of forms, color, color, hue, that which colors, right? Because what happens when you blush? Your face turns red, it, it's doing what? It's covering your natural color, right? Um, Another suffix form, cella, storeroom, chamber, cell, cella, cellar, cellarer. What is a cellarer? It's the person who goes down in the cellar and brings the beer out of the cellar. Or someone who runs a cellar, which is where you keep the hidden stuff, you know. Stuff for island, etc. All those words come from just. Old English, excuse me, Indo-European cattle. Okay. This is why, you know, when you start to study um, Indo-European, you know, it can get really, really interesting because you start to see parallels. You start to see, you know, cognates in all kinds of, um, all kinds of areas. Okay, let me leave that aside. I'm trying to catch up some things that I said I would mention before and forgot to. Or didn't bring. Here is this is an example of which is it, agglutinative or appropriative? One of those two types. This is that Turkish word. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. Okay? That breaks down into one, two, three, four, five, five elements that mean. America, the li means from, lar means, it's indicating plural, dan means <coughs> from, among. Oh, that's not how you spell among. Are you sure that's what that, it's got to be among. A-M-O-U-N-G, no, A-M-O-N-G. Should have corrected um, And then this means are you, so. Are you from among those who are from America? Not one. Here's a sentence. It's one word. Are you an American? But it means much more than that. Katie Kizzy Isserdi, the cat bit the girl. Kidigi Kiz is I think that's an E. No, that's an R. Isserdi, the girl bit the cat. So <laughs> this notice is indicating it's accusative, right? Not doing the action of the verb, right? Because that's nominative. It's receiving. This is, I mean, that's an example, a pretty good example of an inflection that we don't have anymore. We don't indicate that kind of, you know, part of speech by inflections at all in English. The only one, the only time that we inflect to indicate you know, case, there's only one. What is it? Possession. 
It's the only time we add an ending onto a word. So the original eight Indo-European cases, in terms of adding inflections on, in English, that survives today in nouns with one instance, possessive. Okay? Because plurality is a little bit different. That's not case, that's number. We still indicate you know, differences um, that way. Any questions about anything we've done so far? Okay. Well, we've done all of the backgrounds of English. We've done the language fundamentals. So like I said, we are way ahead. I mean, we're not supposed to have an exam over this until... February 19th, and it's January 29th. Um, I'd rather not start Old English until we do an exam. So let's go ahead and have the exam on Thursday. This Thursday. Uh, <laughs> I really feel like I need no, I'll, 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 that'll be fine. I really feel like I need some more study time. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Because um, we're still going to be like two weeks ahead. I don't know how that happens. I really feel a little lost. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay. Then what we'll do for Thursday, we'll just kind of have an open review. Come with questions. That is fantastic. Okay. Thursday's the 31st. So, so come with questions, and then Tuesday the 5th, we'll have the exam, and we'll still be <laughs> two entire weeks ahead. Would, it, would it be possible for maybe Thursday you came with study suggestions? Uh, Other than just all of our notes? <laughs> well, I mean, that's pretty much the study suggestions. <laughs> Review the notes, review how the notes are, you know, distilled from the, from the text. So if you've not, for example, been reading the textbook, you, you need to. I mean, I, it's a sign there. Origins 3, 3, 2, 2. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of stuff. And the Germanic part is probably the hardest part, especially Grimm's Law. Um, okay, that's what we'll do.